All right, why don't we go ahead and get started. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Medical Grand Rounds. I'm Bob Wachter, Chair of the Department of Medicine. Uh, you see the ground rules here. I think you know them by now. If you have questions, type them in the Q&A box. And uh, uh, Lakshmi Santosh, who is our Director of Grand Rounds, will be mining them and uh, pitching some to me. Uh, session will be recorded on our uh, uh, website there and our uh, YouTube versions of these Grand Rounds over the past year and a half now have garnered about two and a half million views. Uh, closed captioning is available uh, to you. So uh, uh, really look forward to today's session. I should also uh, give you a couple of quick reminders. Uh, next week, we will be off and replaced by uh, the Chancellor's State of the uh, University Address. So at this time, Thursday uh, noon next week, that will uh, be on and we'll come back uh, the week after that. Uh, let me quickly say go Giants, uh, big game tonight but also to warn you that my son, uh, older son, works doing money ball for the Atlanta Braves. So uh, if the Giants win, I may be the most hated person in San Francisco next week as I'm rooting for the Braves. Uh, let's go ahead and get started today. When I was a kid, and I'm dating myself here, uh, when there was a really big, complicated set of issues with uh, evolving news, you turned on the TV and you turned to one of the three networks at the time and you went to see what Walter Cronkite thought about it. Uh, he was sort of the national trusted spokesperson. He was the anchor on the CBS Evening News. And he told you kind of what to make of this uh, evolving, rapidly swirling uh, news. And he was trustworthy and soothing and fair-minded. And, and, and in many surveys, year after year, he was the most trusted uh, person in the United States. Uh, COVID created a need for everyone, whether you were a healthcare insider or a lay person, to also to understand this rapidly swirling uh, ecosystem of, uh, of information, complicated, uh, tinged with politics, often uh, changing all the time. Uh, but the environment is different with uh, myriad ways of getting information. You can choose your own adventure uh, and the waning influence of credentialed experts. So in my mind, I think the, we needed a, our own Walter Cronkite for the COVID era and uh, uh, to deal with this fire hose of information, make sense of it and provide it to us in a way that was uh, thoughtful and trustworthy. And I am proud to say that I think, in my mind, the person who emerged in our country as the trusted national resource is a graduate of our residency and a former chief resident here uh, and a dear friend, Ashish Jha. And I'm thrilled that Ashish is uh, uh, joining us again today uh, to uh, talk uh, all things COVID. So uh, I'm going to make the bio short. By now, you know Ashish. She is a, a recognized globally as an expert on pandemic preparedness as well as health policy research and practice. Some people just discovered Ashish a year or two ago, which would be too bad because for the last couple of decades, Ashish, I think, has been le the leading thinker on matters of health policy and health services research, and I have learned a massive amount from him over the years. He spent most of his career after leaving UCSF at Harvard and the Harvard School of Public Health, uh, where he ran the Harvard Global Health Institute. And I guess a year and a half or so-ish ago, he uh, moved to Brown University to become the Dean of the School of Public Health uh, there and is doing, as expected, an extraordinary job. Uh, those of you at the VA can see Ashish's uh, picture. It's the first picture of the, in the wall of uh, fame of chief residents. He and Hal Collard were chief residents together. I was chief resident at the VA about 100 years before Ashish, but there was no photography then, so my picture is not there. So uh, with that, let me just uh, stop and welcome Ashish. I'm thrilled that you could be with us. Uh, thank you. Um, I don't know that I've ever seen the Walter Cronkite reference. I like it. No, I'm kidding. I appreciate that. It's extremely generous. Um, more than anything else, it's just super fun to be back at UCSF. I was there in person a couple of weeks ago, but um, uh, now I get to be back virtually and really delighted. So thank you for having me back, and I'm looking forward to our conversation. Me too. Uh, and we'll, I'm going to divide this into three major buckets. Uh, give you your, give, let's get your take on some of the hot issues of the day. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, your personal uh, impression of, of, of how things have gone over the last eight months, including your own life and how it's changed. And then we'll talk big picture about what we've learned as a society uh, in terms of big organizations and politics and how to better prepare for the future. So let's start with sort of issues of the day. Uh, boosters. Uh, where do you stand on boosters? Good idea, bad idea, should be, quote, concentrating on vaccinating the unvaccinated, et cetera. Let me get, let you riff on that and we'll move on then. 
Yeah, so thank you. And it's a good, it's a good place to start given where the FDA advisory committee is meeting today on the Moderna booster, um, obviously a couple of weeks ago on, on Pfizer. Um, I think, and I may be the only person in America, um, I think President Biden mostly got it right on when he came out, I think it was August 18th or 20th and said everybody's going to need a booster and people should. Now, there's an issue of process. Should the White House have gotten ahead of the FDA? And we can talk about that. Uh, but my sense is people are going to need boosters. Um, and, um, you know, is it absolutely essential that people get boosters? No, we still see very high levels of protection against severe illness. But severe illness is not the only thing we care about. And if we have vaccines, which we do, uh, and it provides protection against breakthrough infections, which I think boosters, in my mind, clearly do, um, we should use them. And, um, and my sense is that we should begin with high-risk people and then move on to everybody else. And I guess I'd be really, really surprised if we weren't at a point by, let's say, December, January, where everybody uh, who's six months out had gotten, uh, had not gotten. It. I mean, people, I think people won't get it, but won't be advised to get it. I think everybody will end up needing a booster. I think everybody will get one. Um, I don't also see this as a trade-off with vaccinating uh, the world or vaccinating unvaccinated people in America. Obviously, the marginal benefit of a booster is much smaller than the marginal benefit of getting vaccinated if you're unvaccinated. And if that was the trade-off, and we can talk about whether there's a trade-off on the global vaccination side, I don't see one. But if that was the trade-off, then there's no question we should work on, on focusing on, on getting people uh, their first shot. I don't think see that as a trade-off. Like We need to continue working on getting unvaccinated Americans vaccinated. We need to do a lot more on global vaccinations, but we still need to get Americans who uh, who are six months out of their vaccines, a third shot. Yeah, I was always struck when I, I, I heard two, two lines always struck me. One was, we need to concentrate on vaccinating the unvaccinated, and this is the domestic version. And I was like, what does that mean? Like, what are we not doing right. <laughs> that we should right. be doing? Exactly. Right. And, and I, this is definitely one where like, we can do both. And, yeah. and I don't, again, and I think there is absolutely the right amount of energy happening on unvaccinated people. We've got to do a lot more and we can talk about what else we can do. Um, but it doesn't feel like the booster conversation is taking away. The only thing I guess you could make the case, and I'm skeptical of this, by the way, is does discussions of boosters make some people less confident about getting the first shot? Right. And there's some survey data to, to that effect. But I am not at all convinced that if we stop talking about boosters and let just, you know, let elderly people have breakthrough infections, that somehow that's going to get a lot of unvaccinated people to line up and start getting like I, I just I don't see it. I don't you can make it. the alternative argument that seeing more breakthrough infections will dissuade people from getting vaccinated. Look, the vaccines don't work. Yeah. 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 So I'm I'm I just feel like we got to be able to do both. And and, and these are not the right trade offs. In my mind. OK. Uh, and in terms of the international trade off, which is, is, is more credible in a way, um, do you, is there anything to that argument that that we should be taking you know, these, these tens of millions of doses and shipping them somewhere, either because that's the ethically right thing to do or that it's actually in our self-interest to get other people vaccinated to prevent variants. Yeah. Um, so if I was convinced that just cutting off boosters would have a big impact on global vaccinations, we, could, we should talk about that. Um, there are two sets of reasons why I think that's not quite right. And again, theoretically, it seems right, you know, limited supply, where do you allocate? But of course, the reality is always a bit more complicated than that. One set of realities is that we have distributed about 80, 90 million doses that are sitting in states right now. You can't go back and take those vaccines and package them up and send them to India. Like that's not a thing. Um, so we've got to use the vaccine doses we've already distributed to states. And by the way, the reason it's not a thing is because of chain of custody issues. India is not going to take the vaccine that was sitting at CBS. Um, so uh, you know, so therefore, a lot of those vaccines are going to go to waste. We've actually wasted probably about 15, 20 million doses of vaccines, and we're going to waste a lot more. So from a like, should I should we give boosters to 75 year olds in, in nursing homes, 80 year olds in nursing homes, or should we let those vaccine doses go to waste? That's a diff that's to me a no brainer. The other part is I think people and this is a place where I, I keep feeling like I'm missing something, Bob, because I'm looking at the global numbers. And you know, we're vaccinating, we're putting in a billion doses a month into people's arms around the world. And what are we going to do on boosters? Like, you know, 10, 20 million, 30 million a month? It's 3% of the global supply. 
Yeah. If you say we're going to definitely give boosters to all the high risk people and only low risk people, we're going to give away. It'd be half that. Like it's just it's a drop in the bucket on the global. Feels feel symbolic more than real. Correct. Feels symbolic that it's 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 we're making a statement as opposed to truly you know this number is making a material difference in the rest of the world. Exactly. And look, symbolism is very important. Protecting uh, lives of people here is also very important. And I, I'd rather just um, use them. We have them. I, I, again, we should be doing a lot more on global vaccinations, no doubt. But we should uh, use the vaccines we have for. OK, let's turn to mandates. Where do where do you are you, are you surprised where we find ourselves? Do you think they're working? I, they are working. Um, you know, my conclusion looking at the data is there's a noisy minority of, in most industries, one, two percent who are like not going to take them. They're going to, they'll lose their job, but they won't get vaccinated. And it's not enough to really cause serious problems in, in almost any industry or business. Um, but they get a lot of headlines. I mean, they're, you know, we've seen this, right? With We saw it initially with Houston Methodist back in May when they were the four and the first. Saw so it with United Airlines. Uh, but newspapers really elevate the, you know, the, the flight attendant who's been a flight attendant for 30 years who says, I will go down fighting and I will not get vaccinated. But the numbers just don't bear out a huge problem on this. The other thing is, you know, people often say to me, well, instead of mandates, we should use persuasion. I, as a public health person, always want to start with persuasion. And if somebody out there has like a really good set of tools that we think are going to move large numbers of people over the next few months, I'm totally game. I don't think they exist. I don't think giving people like, you know, shots for shots or $100 gift certificates, they do, they work on the margins, if at all. Um, Well, they had such an idea. I don't know why they've been hiding it from us for the last year. If this is the time to trot it out, bring it on. (laughs) We're ready for it. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I have the, 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 the winner of the next year's Nobel Prize in behavioral economics has to go to the person that convinced the NFL that if you if you don't get vaccinated, your team's for your team will forfeit the game. If there's an outbreak, you lose your salary and your team and the opposing team will lose their, lose their salary. So you're going to have 100, 275 pound guys who want to kill you. That's pretty good. That's I mean, a good. That's a good. Incentive. I don't think it's scalable, but I think that's a pretty good. <laughs> All right. Uh, testing. Michael Mina was on last week. Yeah. I have to say, every time Michael's on, uh, I am convinced that we should all be doing rapid tests. They're great. And then I leave and st- start scratching my head a little bit about the use case. Like where I, I am convinced by him and you and others that it's really in a very important part of our, our arsenal and that the, you know, they really in some ways are a better test than the PCR for the reasons that we would want to use them, meaning are you infectious now, yes or no? But then trying to figure out, okay, where, when, I, you know, I, I went to visit my folks in Florida and I went to Walgreens and bought a couple for 30 bucks, which was annoying. And then they sat in my suitcase. I wasn't quite sure, like, when do I use this? I feel fine. So I, I would have used it if I woke up and felt crummy, but what's your thinking about where testing fits into the, the, the whole set of activities? Yeah. So I love Michael. Um, He's been a beacon of kind of clarity on this. Um, All of that is my way of saying, I think maybe there's a place where I'm starting to diverge a little bit from his him. Um, There is no question that rapid testing, which we had available, would have made an enormous difference last year when all of us were unvaccinated. And in an unvaccinated population, they remain very, very, very important. and I can make all sorts of use cases of whether it's people back at work, people who are unvaccinated at school. Um, there are, I think, very reasonable use cases. I think the question of how to use them in a vaccinated population is far less well understood. Um, I will tell you my, like, so certainly the availability means that if you wake up, and I'll tell you how we've, I've used it. Um, and again, it's 30 bucks for two is annoying. Um, you know, I have a nine-year-old who's not vaccinated. Uh, and one morning he woke up and indeed had a sore throat and a, and a runny nose. And I was like, let's pull out the Binax now. And we, and he was negative. And, um, but I did it again the next day, just felt better. And then I, then I just felt like I could stop. Mm-hmm. That's a very good, and it's a, so much easier than like setting up an appointment, going in a PCR test, waiting 36 hours for a result. Like it was cheap and easy. And I felt like this was a really good reason to do it. Um, last week, I was in New York, and this one I feel more marginal about, and I'll be curious what you think. Um, last week, I was in New York, 
and had a, a somebody hosted a dinner for about 20 of us in her uh, very, very, very uh, large New York City apartment. And, but it was indoors. And she said, you know, I'm a little uncomfortable. Everybody's gonna be vaccinated. I'm a little worried. What else can, what can I do? And I said, if you're a little uncomfortable, like you could ask everybody to get a rapid test that day. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't eliminate the risk, but boy, you've taken a low risk situation and made it much lower. Yeah. I think that's a great use case. Um, for vaccinated people, I think there are individual cases like that. You know, I, I've gone seen my elderly parents. I didn't test myself before. I could make the case maybe I should have. But the mental model there is you're vaccinated, you are asymptomatically spreading. We've seen a little bit of asymptomatic spread among vaccinated people, but not a lot. Mm -hmm. And I think that window is very narrow. So I, I think these tests are, are going to be helpful before big gatherings, before big events, before uh, dinners with 20 people indoors uh, for people who are a bit more risk averse. I don't know that that um, for vaccinated people, I have very clear, like ongoing, should I be testing myself twice a week? I don't think so. No. And, and, and I mean, you'll do it for a few weeks and then you'll stop because it's like it's always negative and why, why bother? So yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I'm in sort of the same boat as you. I Very valuable, but trying to find those cases where it's useful other than either your tolerance of being wrong is zero, and it sounds like that dinner party was that, or, uh, uh, or in the unvaccinated circumstance, you know, when you're trying to create as safe an environment as you can with unvaccinated people, I think that makes some sense. Yeah. Uh, schools, where, what do you think, are we getting it right this year after having gotten it wrong last year? I know you advise, I think your kids school. And so kind of, what are they doing? Yeah. And this is interesting, right? Because, um, I, I, so I wrote a like little thread, like two nights ago and classic, like, you know, it just sets off all this anger on both sides of the political aisle. Um, so my short little thread was basically like, yeah, we, there's a group of us, I was, it's, it's got like Eric Rubin, who's the editor in chief of the New England Journal, on our little school advisory group. Um, it's it's a uh, it's 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 got a lot of really terrific people on it, um, and uh, we basically came up with a set of advice that every single person could predict, right? We called for masking uh, indoors, right, uh, for kids and adults. We actually wanted to suggest that the mayor put in a, a vaccine mandate for all adults. Uh, she basically said, that's my decision. I don't need to hear that from you. So we said strongly, strongly encouraged. And then she ended up putting in a vaccine mandate. So that's good. Um, there've been a lot of upgrades to ventilation. We talked a little bit about that. Uh, and then we said weekly testing. And we did not make a big deal about social distancing. We said avoid like super crowded uh, assembly halls. We said, we talked a little bit about how you might space out lunch and stuff. But generally we said, if all the adults are vaccinated, most, ki most kids are vaccinated, everybody's wearing a mask, people are getting tested once a week and you have good ventilation, distancing just does not become as important at that point. And we're five weeks in, uh, infection numbers in schools are lower than they are in the community and they're pretty low in the community. Yeah. And ever since schools opened, infection numbers in our community have gone down, not up. It's working fine. Um, and you know what's interesting, right? Is of course the response from a chunk of people are Florida didn't do any of those things and Florida was fine, but Florida wasn't fine. Like Florida had a lot of kids getting infected. The UK's got a lot of kids getting infected. And then of course you have a bunch of other people who make the argument, well, you're in Newton Public Schools, Newton's a uh, relatively wealthy school district. Sure, you can do that. I have to say that that argument had more salience a year ago. I don't buy that at this moment. Mm -hmm. um, there's plenty of resources out there. Um, we're not talking about things that are super complicated to pull off. I mean, maybe weekly testing is a bit, but masks are not, uh, ventilation upgrades are not at this point. I do think most school districts can do this. And if they haven't, there's got to be some accountability for that. Um, so as a general rule, I feel like schools should be fine this uh, fall. And then, of course, with kids getting vaccinated soon or younger kids getting vaccinated soon, that'll add another la layer of protection. My expectation is kids will go through this entire academic year um, largely fine. One last point is we put in a, a test and stay policy, which lots of places are doing, because if you don't, then every time there's a kid who's infected, that entire classroom is out quarantining for 14 days or 10 days. 
And that to me is ridiculous. And test and say just lets kids stay in school. So test and say, just to be clear to folks, is, is, is not the kid who is infected, but contacts get tested with a rapid test. And if they're okay, they can go to school that day. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. What's the what's the value? What's the incremental value of that weekly test? Should it be twice weekly? What kind of test is it? Does yeah, it add there, anything? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. Last summer, um, uh, Rochelle Walensky and, and Adil Patel and other, a few other folks did some nice modeling work that showed even once a week, uh, reduces infections enough that you can probably suppress. As long as community transmission is not terrible, you can probably suppress infections. Maybe marginally better to do two. One is hard enough. Um, they're also how you do the once a week. So you don't want to necessarily do everybody in school one day. You want to mm -hmm. actually space it out. So you're doing 20% every day. Um, reasonably good data that even with no other mitigation, that probably would help a lot. With all the other mitigation stuff, we think it's, it's probably enough. Got it. And are mandates for the 12 to 18 year old? For vaccines, vaccine, not vaccine? yet. No, I mean, we're okay. not quite at LA level yet. I mean, I, I actually, by the way, uh, really support that. I thought LA was, did a great job. And I, I was very supportive. I spoke to um, Mark Daly and, and others in, in California. I thought Governor Newsom's policy of requiring it next year uh, for kids is exactly right. So I, I, I'm very supportive of those. Okay. We didn't do it here. Uh, last issue for sort of the, uh, the, the issues of, of, of the day, uh, the, the Merck's new antiviral agent. I feel like Trump, I'm calling it Merck's, you know, I'm calling it Merck rather than the name because it's too hard to pronounce. <laughs> so uh, game changer, marginal benefit, what, where do you see it fitting in? Let's assume it, let's assume it plays out and is as good as it seems to be in the early studies. I think helpful, right? Like, I think we've all thought that having an oral therapy um, that reduces severity will help. It's certainly going to be better and more um, available, easier to implement than the monoclonal antibodies, which also are helpful um, early on after, uh, you know, in the kind of viremic phase of the, of the infection. I, I, the thing that comes up a lot, I get asked a lot, and, and people have started saying is, well, if you have monoclonal antibodies and you have this, maybe you don't need a vaccine. And... Um, I mean, of course, that's nonsense. Like people need a vaccine, and we everybody on, on this call understands why that is. Um, but I think as a as a part of the tool set, and I guess part of what I've been thinking about is like, so you know, I have I have elderly parents, and and um, they got their booster, but they might still get a breakthrough infection at some point. I can imagine in six months. I'd love it if there were some tools to like reduce uh, the severity of the of the infection for them. And so the idea that you could call in a prescription on day two and they could take a five day course and it'll help reduce severity. I think it's great. So I think okay. it becomes part of the tool set. Game great. changer, I don't know, but part of the tool set. Yeah. All right, let's turn to you personally. Uh, first of all, how's the new job? You, it's not new anymore, but you started it right as this whole thing was breaking. And so you've had to juggle all of that. So how's it going? It's great. I am, yeah, I'm in month 14 or whatever. So I started last September 1st. And um, it's terrific. The, the biggest challenge of starting a new job is, you know, so much is about, of, of leadership is about relationships that you have with people that you're, um, you're working with. And Zoom is a perfectly fine platform for maintaining relationships. It's absolutely awful, awful for building. Mm -hmm. And so it has really been in the last few months that I've started being able to meet people. We've made a lot of institutional mm -hmm. organizational changes that needed to be made and had to do it in a context where most people didn't know who I was beyond seeing me on Zoom or on, uh, you know, on random television. And that has been really, really challenging. And that's the one part that I feel I really miss about just a normal start. But that said, it's enormous fun to think about where does public health need to go and then try to build an institution that meets that moment. Um, and, uh, and it's a great place. And, you know, I, I loved my time at Harvard. I was there for 16 years. Uh, it's important to like, it's important to get out, work somewhere else. And I, for me, at least, it was the right time to, to try out a new place, a new institution and a new role. And I'm having a lot of fun. Great. When you took the job, when you, uh, you, you, were, you were incredibly well known in professional circles and not particularly well known in public circles. And by the time you started there, you were a rock star. How did that influence your uh, ability to do your job, the way you were perceived? It, it must have changed things a lot. 
it changes things a lot in the sense that I don't know about rock star, but I'm certainly much more public. And well, you have to take you have to go with the Cronkite or rock star. I can't accept that you won't <laughs> accept either one of those. So <laughs> you can choose. Uh, you know, the challenge, Bob, to be very frank, is is um, that in academia, we're a little suspicious of TV doctors. And, um, and, you know, like being a TV doctor does not build your credibility in academia. And for people who've known me for a long time and know that, like, I really deeply care about academic work and have uh, invested a lot of my life in it and, and um, believe in it. And, and it, it's, it's different, right? Because then they just say, okay, this is a different phase. But for people who don't know me, this is all they've seen. Right. I think it has been interesting because for supporters of Brown, for the broader Brown community, I think they've kind of, they like the idea that like their public health dean is somebody who's very public. I think it's spread some amount of, of skepticism within the faculty who are like, do you really understand what it's like to be an academic? Right. Do you really understand what it's like to like spend all your time writing grants? I'm like, oh yeah, I mean, I do, but of course, <laughs> um, but I can say it. And again, I think it's the lack of the personal connection that has made that uh, complicated. Yeah, understood. All right, let's do a quick uh, lightning round of what you're doing in your personal life. Uh, uh, and feel free to say, I'm not telling you. Uh, did you get a booster? Not yet. I will, uh, um, probably will. sometime in the next few weeks. Yeah, I got a Moderna, I felt very calm. It's been eight months. I feel very comfortable waiting a little bit longer. Uh, I will probably, but I haven't yet. Okay. And I assume you'll get Moderna if if the time comes based yeah. on the mix and match I, stuff. Is that? Yeah, the mix and match stuff. I don't I don't know what your read of uh, the data from NIH that I think came out yesterday. yesterday yeah. um, and we'll see what the FDA advisory committee says tomorrow. I think mix and match is probably the right answer if you've gotten a and j but it's unclear to me. Like there's no benefit if you got Moderna to get Pfizer or vice versa yeah. um, or not much of a benefit. So I think I'll just get another Moderna shot. Yeah, I think that that's my read as well. It's a pretty much nothing burger when it comes to the mRNAs. And but for the J and J, I think it does answer the question more clearly that you should get if you should get a booster and it should be a Pfizer or Moderna rather than an, another J and J. Yeah. Um, are you flying? Obviously, you said you were in New York and you said you were in California, so I'm guessing you are. Yeah. Yeah, I am, and I have a funny story, which is so when I was out in California, I was in San Francisco for a couple of days, and I went down to L.A. And when I flew back. Um, you know, I had, uh, I had a, it was a totally packed flight. I was in the window seat and, uh, this woman who sat down next to me in the middle row, a uh, middle seat, um, you know, just her mask consistently just covered her upper lip, but kind of barely. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, I asked her, the flight attendant asked her, she was very annoyed about covering her nose. Uh, but then she said, I recognize you from TV. And I, you know, and then she said, you seem like a nice man, but I'm not getting vaccinated. <laughs> oh, <geez. laughs> like unvaccinated, vaccinated, unmasked person. Right. We just got on the plane. We have a six hour flight together. This how is long, not how long can I hold my breath? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, and I, you know, because airplanes have very good ventilation and I generally don't tend to worry about it excessively once I'm on the plane, I just wear a reasonably good uh, surgical mask, uh, you know, that I have. And I had a, um, KF94 in my uh, in my briefcase, and I actually like got up and pulled it out. I don't I don't blame you. I, think I just was cool. not that excited about that. So I I am flying. I don't love sitting right next to somebody who's unvaccinated, unmasked. Uh, I think we're going to see more and more difficulties with keeping masks on people on airplanes, especially for longer flights. And that moment, I think I just sort of switched and said, I think it's time for a vaccine mandate for flights. Yeah. Um, Vaccines or, or a negative test. I think a negative test is fine too. Uh, but I think it's time. Yeah, I agree with you. Um, why don't you wear, why wouldn't you have worn the N95 or, or equivalent anyway? Why, why, why did it take, because it's funny, I mean, we all do this, you know, you walk in and you say, this seems like a risky situation, but you walk into a lot of risky situations, and you have no idea. So yeah. how do you make that choice? Um, well, the main reason is is my surgical mask is just much more comfortable. And if I'm going to be on a six hour flight, especially when I'm going to try to get a little sleep because an overnight flight, uh, then I'd rather wear a surgical mask unless I think. And so how do I decide? Again, I think there has not been a ton of transmission on airplanes. Um, 
And so that's why I think the plane itself is relatively low risk. Um, I wear KF94 is when I think that there is going to be some sort of, I, like I, you know, I got my hair cut last weekend, right? Um, I wore a KF94. Why? Because somebody's going to be very close to my face for, and I don't know, like, are they wearing a cloth mask? I don't know if they're vaccinated. And I just thought, mm -hmm. I'm just going to wear it. So I think things where I'm going to have close encounter with people whose vaccine status I don't know, for me, that's what does it. Otherwise, I think a good quality surgical mask is reasonably good in most situations. Okay. Uh, we were talking about how you're using testing. Uh, would you get together with a group of six or eight friends and, and uh, let's assume you knew they were all vaccinated? I have. And everybody's mask is off. That's okay. Yeah. Indoors uh, mask is off. It's six people. Part of it is like, you know, um, I don't think any of them, um, you know, they're like graying hairs as I am. So they're probably not going out to, to a bar the night before. Like they tend to be kind of lower risk. Um, plus they're vaccinated. Uh, I think it's fine. I think if somebody was kind of high risk, I may think about things like a test, but I, but I feel like it's pretty comfortable. It's not zero risk. I may get a breakthrough infection out of them if one of them ends up being infected, but yeah, so far I've been pretty comfortable doing that. Yeah. Do you do it? Can I uh, yeah. Small, small group. I, it, my, my ground rules are a hundred percent confident they're vaccinated and a hundred percent confident that if they felt crummy that day. They would say so and not show up. Yeah. And, Indeed. and a small and small, what I, you know, six, eight, 10, maybe not sort of larger than that. Those are my ground rules. Yeah. Um, and the plane, my ground rules, I generally am wearing the N95 for the reason that you took yours out of your bag and it's uncomfortable and I dislike it, but it's sort of, and I sort of see the plane as two different things. One is a really safe indoor space and the second is a flying restaurant. And so I really try to keep it on while everybody else is eating. <laughs> and uh, you know, I, I it's, you know, it's interesting. We're all just making this up as we go along. Make it up. You know, and, and but that actually is the interesting part of this, right? Which is, um, there's really so little guidance on all this stuff. And people are hungry for guidance. People just need to know in these particular situations, what should they do? Yeah. And, um, and it's not totally clear to me. I mean, maybe it's okay, but it's not totally clear to me that like, you know, that we should be getting it from random guys, random people. Like we, shouldn't the CDC be giving us kind of more thoughtful guidance? How, how could it? I mean, I, you know, I, I get that and it, it feels like they should, but you know, the guidance for you, you're 10 years younger than I am. The guidance for you probably should be a little different than for me. And the guidance for me is probably different than 72 year old who had cancer four years ago. You know, it's so nuanced. And so, yeah. and then it goes down to your, how much virus is there in, com in your community and when and what's you your risk your vaccine tolerance? and my God, it's, it's almost impossible. So then I agree. So then, but so what people need is less guidance, I suppose, or specific guidance and more how to think about it, right? Mm -hmm. And that's the part maybe where we could use a little bit more help. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you could argue that that is what both of us have been doing for the last 18 months is yeah. trying to help people wade through that. Yeah. Um, okay. Let's turn to sort of big picture policy politics issues and we've about 25 minutes left. Um, Biden administration, uh, you know, we were all waiting for January 20th for a new world. Uh, they came in, seemed to, it was all going to be about the science and they were competent. And we know a lot of the people uh, who were in the administration who were, it's, the ones I know are terrific. Uh, how would you grade them over the last uh, 10 months? I think reasonably well. Um, are there things they could have done better? Absolutely. Uh, look, their first job when they showed up was to get vaccines distributed across the country and get vaccines into people's arms. And I think they did a great job of that. Um, they are a big part of the reason why we didn't really get crushed with the alpha variant as we got into March, April, May. Um, I think they could have done some things differently on that. I wish they had listened to two guys who wrote this piece about uh, delaying a second shot until... Um, uh, but they didn't, but, they, but the point was, uh, they, uh, I think they did that part well. Um, you know, the challenge is if you look at what has happened over the last few months, and obviously we've had a horrible surge and the question is, could the Biden administration have done much more to prevent what happened in the South over the summer? Um, and it's hard to know what else they, they've been trying to push on vaccines, um, 
you know, they're not going to force southern states to take on different actions. I think they, they, they certainly weren't going to convince DeSantis to have an indoor mask policy for the whole state of Florida. Um, so I think they have some limitations. I wish they had actually done much more on testing and testing kind of ramp up. They did in September when President Biden came out with his new plan, but I wish they had done that last March. Uh, they relied too much on vaccines only strategy. And then the last but not least, and this is a place where I would knock them a little bit, is their communication has been less than stellar. And on a whole bunch of issues, they have um, kind of waffled between, between what's the White House saying, what's the FDA saying, what's the CDC saying, what is Tony Fauci saying. And I think they should have done a better job of coordinating a, uh, the communication strategy, because I, I actually think that has been harmful uh, yeah. to the whole pandemic response. Let me just, your, your line about this, the single shot was a little cryptic. So just for folks Sorry. to know that <laughs> Ashish and I wrote a piece uh, editorial in the Washington Post arguing that, that uh, in the early days, people should have gotten, we should have gotten more people to get their first shot sooner, delayed the second shot, which is what the UK did, which I think we both came to the conclusion would have saved more lives sooner. When Delta came, that turned out to would have been a bad strategy because the first shot didn't do very much. But at least at the time, the first shots got you, you know, 80 percent of the way there. Yeah. And, and Delta didn't really show up until late June. And by that time, everybody would have gotten their second shot because we had right. plenty of vaccines. By right. right. Yeah. So I think if uh, that still would have made an enormous difference, but yeah. water under the bridge at this point. Yeah. Uh, why I've been struck with the same thing in terms of the administration. And we know a lot of the people that were in charge of communication and they're good people. And I, they certainly came in getting how important communication, public health communication was. So is it just harder than it looks or why, why hasn't it been as good as it should have been? I think there are a couple of problems. There are a couple of structural problems. Um, one is, uh, so one is that they're reacting to the Trump administration. At the Trump administration, there was so much kind of micromanaging of messaging out of the CDC and FDA from the White House. And, and a lot of it very harmful micromanagement that I think on one hand, they kind of want to leave things alone and let CDC and FDA do it and, and not appear to be um, influencing or shaping messaging out of CDC and FDA. I get that, you know, kind of let the scientists do their thing, but it's actually a bit of a problem because if what you're hearing out of the FDA is a little different from what Rochelle is saying at, at CDC and it's different from what Tony Fauci is saying at the White House, it creates dissonance. And um, I think that they need a single person to be the spokesperson or two or three people who get together and make sure they're saying the same thing. And I don't know that that's happening with the kind of uh, consistency so it is complicated. It's complicated by the fact that they don't want to be seen as interfering. You know, when I think about the, the mask policy in May that when CDC said indoor, you know, vaccinated people don't need to be wearing masks indoors. Um, somebody asked Dr. Fauci, to, uh, asked Tony, uh, you know, when did he find out? And basically he found out an hour before it was released to the public. Uh, that's a yeah. problem. Yeah. Like that. Andy Slavitt Andy Slavitt said he had not heard about it until it was <laughs> released to the public. He was in charge yeah. of the messaging. Yeah. And so I mean, I, I appreciated that Andy had a very, very good role. He's a very good communicator. Like I'm not sure that he should have left when he did, and maybe he could have stayed. Or and again, there are plenty of very Vivek is a terrific, uh Vivek Murthy, obviously the Surgeon General is a terrific communicator. Like a bunch of good people. You just need a small number who are on the same page. And I would worry less about influencing messaging from CDC and FDA. Don't mess with their MMWR reports. Don't mess with the way that their scientists are doing the analysis. But what the message is coming out of those agencies about boosters, about mask wearing, yeah, coordination on that is fine. Those are part of, those are federal agencies. Yeah. Maybe one more CDC question. I want to turn to some of the questions people are sending in. But um, remember when we spoke in the early days, you had said that one of the things that surprised you was CDC's poor performance that you thought, here we have this world-class public health agency. Uh, reading Scott Gottlieb's book, it felt like the poor performance was in some ways sort of systematic and in, embedded in the CDC's culture rather than the impression I had at the time that it was mostly about federal meddling and the Trump administration. So 
What's your take on the CDC and does it need sort of a fundamental reboot for the next one or is the structure right and it really was Washington mucking around? Yeah, I think both CDC and FDA need a fundamental reboot. I don't think either of the two agencies is sort of ready. I, I think the what I worry about, Bob, is because of the mucking of the, of the Trump administration, we will see that as the problem and say, okay, let's just hope that in the future we have a pandemic where we don't have a president who's that's not a solution. And these agencies have not, they, they have admirable people. The agencies have not performed admirably. And I think we can, like, I know a lot of the people in leadership in both of these agencies, even, even last year before the uh, Biden administration came in, really, really good people. Boy, they've gotten a lot of stuff wrong. Um, and it, it's not meddling. I mean, meddling is, I think the, I, I just wanna make sure we don't get distracted by that. I think these are systematic problems. Yeah. Okay. Let me throw a few questions out there that people have asked of us. Do you think that this booster is the last one? And by the way, Moderna, the FDA panel approved Moderna booster. So if you wanted to sign off to get your shot, I would understand. Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> before you know. the rush. Before the rush. Before, <laughs> before the, rush. the rush to the CVS. Um, do you think this is the last one or do you think we're going to be in a world of yearly boosters? That's a really good question. Um, you know, I've been... Um, listening to, to medical brand rounds at UCSF and, and listening to sh people like Shane and others who are very thoughtful about this, Shane Cotty, who's been very thoughtful about this. Uh, my kind of read of this, and I'll be curious what you think, is I doubt it's the last one, last one. I'd be very surprised. Uh, I don't think we're gonna need one every six months. My hope is that you get a bit, and it's not just about antibody levels, right? It's also about um, the quality of the antibodies, which get better with these repeated shots. and. Um, and so my hope is that uh, we get boosters this fall and then probably get another one next year. And people are gonna be working on, on improving the vaccine. And we may be able to get to a point where, where it's not necessarily a three shot regimen, but I, I expect a yearly booster for a while. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and, and what, what is your, I was asked the other day, what are the chances that there's a variant that comes out that's worse than Delta? And I said somewhere between a black swan event and 50%. So that was a <laughs> decisively unhelpful answer. What's, what's your answer on that? Very low likelihood. Like, I don't know if there's a 5% or less. Um, Delta is really contagious and something's going to have to really outcompete it. And it seems uh, low likelihood. You know, every uh, few days, if you read uh, the Twitter thread from Eric Feigelding, um, you know, there's a, oh my God, there is another variant. Right. Uh, and they sort of, you know, mu, remember mu for like five days, everybody was asking me about the mu variant. And then there was a Lambda for a week. These are important. It's possible. One of them will really displace Delta. I'm, I guess I'm unconvinced. Yeah. At least so I mean, the last six months says the Delta wins that race. And I guess the only way to know for sure is to wait and see. Yeah. Um, someone asked a question about mask usage and whether it tapers off at some point. Let me sort of generalize that to a, a different question, which is um, I last night, Trevor Bedford, who's a really smart virologist oh, yeah. and epidemiologist and genetic genetics expert from Seattle, talked about what he sees as the end game. And he said the end game will be uh, 41 to 100,000 deaths per year uh, with about 20% of the population infected every year. That basically we do reach an endemic stage, but because Delta is so much more infectious than flu and the original COVID, that there will be a fair number of people infected. And even if the case fatality rate gets down to flu-like levels, you still end up with twice as many people dying every year of, uh, of COVID than die of the flu. First of all, does that sound right to you? And second of all, if that's right, you know, are we sort of reaching it relatively soon? And and what we're experiencing now, is that our future? Is that what sort of things are going to feel like two, three, four years from now? And if so, I realize it's a nine-part question. Like, you know, does the world divide into parts of the country that are just over it and don't want to do any of this, and other parts like San Francisco and maybe Boston and maybe Providence? I don't know that say, okay, you know, it's like the weather report. It looks like there's a little bit of surge. Let's take the mass out again. Let's go back into a little bit of a defensive crouch. So first of all, what do you think the end game's like? And then what do you think people's responses will be to that if it turns out it's at, it's endemic and it's sort of 2X of a flu season? Yeah. Um, first of all, um, Trevor is brilliant. And, um, 
and I worry that he's right. And the problem with that is, you know, it's not instead of the flu, it's on top of the flu. And you know um, that hospitals get pretty packed in flu seasons. And especially a bad flu season really stretches the healthcare system. And throw in COVID that, you know, it's twice as, you know, twice as many people getting really sick, that is going to break our healthcare system. Like our healthcare system can't tolerate that. So I, I think it's going to be a problem and it was going to require a set of mitigation. Now I don't, you know, look, we're not going to do lockdowns. We're, there's a lot of stuff that we've done in the, in the short run that we're not going to want to do and not tolerate doing. Uh, but so where are things, where can we do things that are going to be meaningfully useful? I, I certainly think uh, making substantial investments in indoor air quality is going to be a part of a long-term solution. And it will help with the flu as well, but it'll help, um, I think, quite a bit with COVID. Um, second, I think the culture of, you know, you're hacking up a lung and you're like you're still in the meeting because you're a really good worker and you're dedicated <laughs> That's going to change. Yeah, uh, it's got to change, and I think you know we're not going to tolerate that. Like you, we all were like, "Oh my God, look at that guy's," you know, he's basically like on death's door, but he's a great resident. He still shows up and does surgery. Uh, people are going to get mad at the person and say, "You need to be home." Uh, so I think that culture change will help. I think some of the you know some of the stuff that I used to sort of make fun of the deep cleaning, all the surface cleaning stuff, like some of it will stay and it'll actually help with the flu. It may not help with COVID, but I think it'll help with, with the flu. And so my take is that it will get better than the scenario he has laid out because the scenario he has laid out will be intolerable mm -hmm. and unmanageable. On the issue of mask wearing, certainly I can imagine that in places like Boston or, or San Francisco or Providence, like if you wake up and you have symptoms, you're gonna wear a mask, that people are gonna expect that much more. And then the second is, yeah, I can imagine, um, at least over the next year or two, uh, situations where if case numbers are rising, uh, you know, a town says for the next three weeks, we're putting in an indoor mask mandate. And um, that's not gonna be everywhere in the country. But I guess my, my point is, I don't see between flu and, and COVID 100, 150,000 people dying every year because we just won't tolerate that level. And so we're gonna make structural changes that will be minorly inconvenient in our lives, not majorly, and we'll probably get used to that. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, one of the things that struck me recently is that we're not talking a lot about infection-related immunity. And, um, and it strikes me, I know you spoke to Andy Slavitt last week and came and discussed the topic of the noble lie. And some sort of feels a little bit like that. We don't want to t say to people that your immunity after infection is actually decent. It, it will wane, but so does it, it wanes after vaccine too. Um, in part, because we don't, we want them to get vaccinated. They should, absolutely should get vaccinated. Yeah. So it, it, if you think about sort of where we are now, you know, if you take a place like San Francisco where 80% of people are vaccinated, very few people have been infected or total immune population is not much higher than the vaccine population. Other parts of the country, it's 30 percent vaccinated, but it's probably 80 you percent know, who didn't get vaccinated, who have seen the virus. So how do you think about infection related immunity in all of this? Yeah, I, 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 I talk about it a lot. And part of it is like I go on Newsmax and a lot. And so I get asked about it a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and I, my general take on, on natural immunity, is this a real thing? Clearly generates uh, uh, immunity. It's very helpful. Uh, there are two problems with natural immunity in my mind. I think the majority of the evidence leans towards, not all the evidence, but majority of it, that vaccine-induced immunity is better. I think that's where the majority of the evidence is. And second, is I don't really like know how to verify um, how good somebody's natural immunity is. I mean, you could check antibody levels, but none of us think that that's a perfect measure or a correlate of, of immunity. And so from a policy point of view, it makes total, so this is where like Marty Macri has been making this very big deal about like people who've been previously infected should not have to go through a vaccine mandate or should be able to get opt out. I feel like, no, because I don't know how to uh, really understand the, uh, and, and vaccine vaccinations are easier to uh, verify. But, you know, I, one of the places I've looked at kind of super closely over the last nine months is South Dakota. I've been really fascinated by South Dakota. At some point, I'm going to go to South Dakota. <laughs> uh, I have not been. Uh, 
It's not. Uh, it's not that you're. It's not that you're putting all your money there. That, that no, that, that's that interesting. Yeah. yeah. Um, no, they have, they had until recently now, Mississippi has surpassed them, uh, but they probably were the most infected state in the country. And, um, and if you look at their infection numbers, they pretty closely tracked Vermont um, for much of the last six months. Um, but, but Sturgis rally caused a relatively big-ish spike in, in, in South Dakota. And my mental model was, yeah, there's a lot of waning of natural immunity in South Dakota because a lot of those infections were last September, October. Mm -hmm. And we're getting getting a year out. And so there's, you know, not as quite as much. So I think natural immunity is obviously a real thing. I talk about it. I just say to people that it's unreliable and you still need to get vaccinated. By the way, if you get vaccinated on top of natural infection, that is an incredibly, that is really robust immunity. Yeah, no, it's it's a superpower. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, let, maybe last big question, then I want a few last things about you. Um, I was talking to a leading global epidemiologist recently, we were talking about the issue of a, a new variant worse than Delta. This person said, I think the chances of a new uh, pandemic bug are actually worse than that. So it sort of raised the possibility that a new pandemic bug will hit. One of the things that struck me as I heard that was, how are we gonna be in dealing with a new pandemic bug the stock responses will be better with testing, will be better with masking, and will sort of better with communication. But there's this new calibration problem, which is like, we're going to assume that every new bug is another COVID. And the last five bugs that could have been COVID turned out not to be. So how it's, it's sort of like hurricane forecasting. If we get it wrong often enough, <laughs> people can stop listening. So how do we get the next one right? So I don't, I don't, I mean, my first reaction when you asked that was to say, I don't know that we can get it right. Um, and let me, let me explain a bit more what I mean by that. Right now, when I think of something like GORN, which is the global um, kind of reporting system for infectious disease outbreaks, uh, you know, they get a report, you know, they get maybe 500 reports a year of things. And almost obviously by like most of them turn out to be nothing. And we're going to have to tolerate a lot of novel pathogens, new things, because the reporting is going to go way up, right? Because now people are like hypersensitive. And one of the things that we're going to have to help people understand is that you're going to hear about lots of things and you're going to have to like not overreact and, and that we're going to be able to figure out and track and explain when something is a problem. Uh, but to because there is going to be a tendency to be like, oh my God, new avian flu that has now infected 12 people who don't have, didn't have contact with, with you know, farms or birds. I, this is a problem. And a lot of this is in my mind, a communication challenge. And it's always hard between noise and signal on these things. Um, and I, 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 my sense is that we're going to have to build surveillance systems that can kind of find our way through this. We're going to have to track stuff and then, uh, and, and probably we'll call it sometimes earlier than we should and get it wrong. In my, my kind of gestalt on this, Bob, and I'll be curious if you see it similarly, is people are pretty tolerant of this stuff if you explain what's going on and how to think about it. Um, if you say, like, we don't, we don't always know when something's going to turn into a pandemic or not. And so you're going to hear about things. And then we'll pull back and say this one turned out not to be. I think most people can understand that and can manage that. Um, Depends what you're asking of them. I mean, if it's, yeah. if we're going to turn the infrastructure on. It's one thing. It's, it's We're going to tell you again to hide under your kitchen table for the next month. They right. won't tolerate that won't if tolerate. it turns out to be wrong. Right. Yeah. But we shouldn't have to ask for that, by the way. To me, that should be very, very, very rare to ask people to be, you know, to be um, the shelter in place stuff should be extremely rare. And that's usually when you've gotten it wrong yeah. um, and the virus has gotten out of control. That's when you need to use that. Otherwise it should be a very rare thing. Okay, maybe last two questions for you. Um, you know, obviously the last 18 months of your life has been turned upside down by the media. And I, you said to me last time, I think that you were spending eight hours a day on it. I assume it's no longer quite that, but it's a massive amount of, time and work. What's been the best part of it? What's been the worst part of it? Um, I think the best part is, yeah, I spent, by the way, a lot less time and even the policy stuff. So before, last time we spoke last fall, it was half basically media and half 
uh, policy stuff, governors, health departments, uh, both of them have come way down, partly because I have a day job. And actually, it's like people at some point expect, they're like, we're paying you, right? So uh, <laughs> I'll show up to the media. Um, and, and, you know, and just being like serious, like there are parts of my job that like, I really do have to show up for, like it turns out. So, sure. um, but, it, but in terms of what uh, has been the best part, I, for a long time, wondered whether all of this media communication stuff was doing any good and whether anybody was paying any attention and listening. And part of it was because I was also pretty shut down. I wasn't out and about and seeing people. And as things have kind of opened up more, uh, it's incredibly gratifying to hear people basically say, this has been really helpful to me. It's been really helpful to my family. And that, to me, is the most meaningful part of this, because it's the public part of public health that I didn't have a good sense of whether it was having a beneficial effect on people, mm-hmm. their behavior and their lives. That has been by far the best part. Um, the worst part of it, you know, I don't love the, I mean, I, I've developed much more of a thick skin, but I still don't love the super angry, super racist, occasional death thready uh, kinds of stuff. Uh, it still comes along and it still kind of catches me off guard sometimes. And I was speaking to a health secretary this morning from a, uh, from a state, and she was saying that uh, she's been pushing mandates in her state, and people started showing up to her home, and she's got two, two young kids, and heckling her as she's trying to get her kids off to school in the morning. And I've had versions of that, not no one showing up to my home to heckle, but people have shown up at work, and I've had harassment, and it's just, it's just unpleasant. And it's hard enough to do all of this stuff. I think all of us have felt this. And that probably is the least fun part of it because it does at times make you start thinking like, is this worth it? But most of the times, most of the feedback has been, it's been helpful. And I find that incredibly gratifying. Great. Uh, Last question. I'm going to ask what's next for you as COVID becomes uh, more recedes in people's, uh, it's it's no longer the first thing they think about in the morning and no longer the first thing on the news cycle. Now, I have to say that I heard you on In the Bubble last week and you pretty unconvincingly denied that you were interested in politics. You're among friends here, so you could tell us if you are going to plan a career in politics. I know you're going to say, I've got this fantastic day job and I want to concentrate on that and all that. That's the right answer. But it has to be that as this thing recedes, the, what you've sort of seen in the past year has to influence sort of what you're thinking about different ways of making a difference. So I'm going to assume you're going to keep your day job and do it incredibly well. But also, this has opened up new avenues for you, new opportunities. So what are, you, what are your thoughts about that? And if you want to reveal that you're running for governor of either, either Massachusetts or Rhode Island here, that would be pretty cool. Would that be OK? Um, <laughs> you know, I'll tell you why uh, I'm not going to run for governor of any state in America or any other. I, the thing I value the most is saying exactly what I'm thinking. And it doesn't always win me friends. Um, Even the university, I think, sometimes would wish that I wouldn't say certain things. Um, But it's the thing I value most in my life. And that is not what you get to have when you are a politician. So um, that is probably the biggest reason why I will never run for after, run for office. Um, you know, this is this is a is a sea change moment for public health. And what's been really clear to me is that public health has to look, act, engage very, very differently coming out of this pandemic. And I know this sounds just like I'm have an important day job. I do have an important day job, and and the day job is to think about what does public health need to look like. Uh, what role do schools of public health play in that? Um, how do we engage? For instance, I think a lot of the pandemic stuff is going to become part of the national security apparatus. Um, how do, what role does public health have to play in that? So there are some big questions in front of us that I'd love to engage in and try to help sort out um, to create a new public health. And that feels very much part of my day job, but it goes beyond like you got to show up to the tenure committee and got to meet with the department chairs. Like those are all really important parts of my job. But there's also a broader envisioning of what do we want public health to look like and what do we need it to do for us in the future? And I'd love to spend more time thinking about that. Great. Ashish, thank you for being such a good friend for me and for UCSF and such a great ambassador and for everything you've done educating so many people over the last uh, year and a half. It really has been uh, tremendously valuable 
And I have to say, you're extraordinarily good at it. I mean, you were sort of built for this, and it's uh, it's been fun watching you flourish in, in that environment. You really, you've done an amazing job. So thank you. Well, thank you for all of those. And, you know, I've said this before, and I, and I mean it, UCSF is still sort of feels like my home. It's a funny thing, right? You spent five years in a place, but like the most formative years of professional identity, and it totally imprints in a way that um, that hasn't changed. And I love being back at UCSF, whether virtually or in person, and I'm looking forward to doing more of it. Great. Thank you. Thank you. All right, folks, if you uh, want CME credit for this, it is available and you'll see a slide that allows you to uh, to go to the appropriate website. As I said before, uh, next week we will have uh, instead of Grand Rounds, we'll have the Chancellor State of the University address and we'll be back with you a week later. So thank you all for uh, for being here and and continue to stay safe and go Giants and then go Braves. Go Red Sox. Oh, stop that. (laughs) (laughs) We'll see you later.